Well, my dad made me a little homemade five foot table for my 11th birthday. Uh, it was an outdoor table, so just uh, played outside, just a game of pool or not even that, just hitting the balls around. But a bit later on, uh, about 13, 14, I bought myself a full, uh, sorry, seven foot table and we played in the garage. At about that time, at 13, 14 years of age, uh, met a friend at my high school and he had a table in his garage and used to go over there and his dad did play billiards. So uh, I started learning a bit about it and got an old book, Herbert Holt, and had a look at that too. Anyway, we used to play each other for the World Garage Championship at 13, 14 years of age. Uh, after that, uh, failed AFL career at uh, Australian Rules Football, but uh, didn't do too bad, but uh, wasn't good enough, so I bought a full-size table and put it in the garage at 15. And from there, uh, really got addicted to snooker and billiards, and in the end of the day, um, played and got to know people at university who were billiard addicts and really got into the game. Well, everybody in Australia, there was a household name in Australia, Walter Lindrum, and all the billiards enthusiasts know about him, but uh, yeah, nowadays, but before, he was an icon in Australian sport. Everybody knew him just like Bradman. Uh, when I was a teenager, he was definitely a hero. Uh, also, uh, for my own uh, personal career, I can't thank Murdo Donoghue enough. He was a hero of mine. He was the big coach of the day, but um, basically a compatriot of Walter Lindrum. And he was the first man ever in the world to make a 147 break. And uh, I used to write to him with questions and catch up with him in my late teens and uh, 20s, and he used to coach me. Uh, it was a bit different then, no mobile phones, no Facebook videos, certainly different, but he was a hero. Other people that uh, had an influence, Tom Cleary, I met him, read about him, and he was a uh, world amateur champion, and he actually went uh, around with Walter Lindgren to do his exhibitions. And then there was the Gannam family. Uh, and when I was growing up, George Gannam Jr. was the undefeated Australian billiards champion. And when, uh, when I decided to play billiards a bit more seriously, the people were saying, why would you bother when Gannam's unbeatable? But uh, in the end, I got him. But he was a very good man and fine character uh, of the game. And his dad also helped me a bit. Uh, I'm not sure if young George was too happy about that, but uh, they were my uh, heroes and I remember that uh, vividly uh, with all those people. I used to read about Lindrum. Lindrum was all over Melbourne. He had his billiard room here. I knew his near niece, Dolly Lindrum. I went to his uh, billiard room and then her billiard room and used to look at all the newspaper cuttings all over the billiard room of uh, Walter Lindrum's career. And I'll tell you what, there were two stories or three stories of that billiard room and they were plastered with um, newspaper cuttings uh, from all over the world. Uh, you could just stay there all day and read about it. The uh, funny story was I got trapped in the lift early on in that uh, uh, Lindrum billiard room on Flinders Street and uh, finally got out and Dolly Lindrum uh, was there waiting for me. Uh, as I was nearly crying, I think it was just about the end of uh, my high school days, but uh, all good, uh, great days. Well, I made them early when I was 12, 13 on a smaller table, but uh, first full size century break was uh, 16 after a few months when I had bought the billiard table, the full size one. Um, when I was 15. I also forgot to mention that Eddie Charlton was a big name in Australia and uh, you know he was uh, he was a very big name and an icon of the sport in my youth uh, so he must have been a hero so that's uh, that was my first century. Uh, it was a big deal that's for sure. Uh, I quit my job at BHP as a graduate accountant after uni 
uh, dreaming of coming to England. And uh, in those days, you didn't really know what was going to go on because no Facebook again, no internet really. So I thought I'd take the plunge. Uh, people were talking about Melbourne going overseas, but I thought, no, I have to only live once, have a go. So I went over after the World Amateur Championship in uh, Malta and uh, went up to uh, Scotland, played a bit and had a look around, uh, seeing the professional scene. Eddie Charlton was going to uh, recommend me. Uh, so I thought I'd take the plunge. You have to win some titles to get uh, accepted. In the end, what was it like? It was a great adventure. Uh, in 83, I remember going to, late 83, going to witness uh, and beating Michael Ferreira in a pro-am. Uh, and uh, that was so exciting. Uh, and then went off to Scotland to play some snooker. And then uh, Mark Lodman took me uh, to Warrington to have, uh, have a look at the uh, professional snooker. And Alex Higgins was there and he said hello. It was all very exciting. Uh, came back uh, to Melbourne and then started my professional career in 1984. Uh, Mark Wildman said billiards was going to get bigger and he was dead right and uh, snooker was just growing into the most uh, uh, prestigious sport in the UK at the time. So I went off to England to start the professional snooker tour in 84 and I really had nowhere to go. Um, in the end, I decided to go to uh, Nuneaton, where Norman Dagley was playing. I did know him from the World Amateur Championship in Malta. And uh, it couldn't have come at a better time, in though I had a really uh, good session there of snooker and billiards. Uh, I made a 600 in practice, and then later on, I made a lot of centuries in a practice match at snooker. So uh, David Atak sponsored me. Uh, when I, uh, from then on, uh, which was great. And uh, my, uh, Joe Nugent in, uh, in uh, Scotland also helped me a lot because I went up there and opened Miller's Snooker Centre. I think it's still there, both of those clubs. And uh, played the legendary Stephen Hendry there and a lot of other great players for uh, uh, side wages. Uh, the poster's still up there actually, uh, a proud moment. But it was tough because you didn't know anybody. You, you know, I remember if I had to ring back uh, to uh, Australia uh, on a payphone, I'd be putting dollar, uh, sorry, pound coins in the payphone by the minute. Uh, very expensive, so you couldn't uh, ring up very often. Uh, you'd write some letters. I'd write to Murd again, to uh, my parents. Then you missed a lot of things, which made it harder. On the other hand, probably wasn't as much pressure in one way because it wasn't instantaneous what was happening. Uh, all your friends or family could find out if you'd won or lost. Uh, but it was a great adventure and uh, really uh, it was uh, a risk worth taking. And uh, yes, I was very proud to win the World Professional Billiards Championship championship in 1986. Uh, it was a very good year for me, that's for sure. Um, being the first Australian since Walter Lindrum to win that title uh, got me a lot of PR uh, back in Australia, but really to just to follow in the footsteps and it was my dream to always try and win that title ever since I started playing billiards seriously from 15, 16. And it, you know, lots of practice uh, and nine years later, uh, to hold the trophy was fantastic. Even more fantastic was it was the boom of snooker. So some money was channeled into the billiards as well. And it was, uh, everybody would watch anything on a billiard table at that stage and um, it was on BBC television. And we got over a million viewers when I played Norman Dagley uh, in the final. Uh, I wanted to get my revenge off Norman the year before he beat me in my first world title. Uh, and uh, that year things went right and uh, it was amazing playing uh, Norman Dagley. He was a great player, won English Amateur Championships uh, by the dozen, I think. And uh, he was the favorite to win the title and uh, he was the crowd favorite, that's for sure. Um, even my manager supported 
uh, Norman Dagley. Yeah, Dave Atak, they used to have the cards next to the table uh, where we used to sit uh, for snooker and billiards on TV. And I saw just before I played that the card was from my manager wishing Norman the best of luck. Because Norman used to work for uh, David Atak in the bar in his other club. Um, it was uh, it was remarkable, but happened to win that, and uh, it was so good. BBC TV, lots of PR, uh, a lot of interest in uh, Australia, because uh, Eddie Charlton had tried to win that title too on a number of occasions, and was runner-up. Uh, the World Professional Championship, you can't get any better than that. a great question that I often reflect on, uh, probably practice too much, uh, used to practice two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, two hours in the evening, and uh, lots of the time I, I didn't know what to practice because I was playing professional billiards and professional snooker. Um, initially I wanted to practice a lot more billiards in Australia and before I won the World Championship. So it was probably two thirds billiards, one third snooker. Uh, but in the end of the day, I, I enjoyed practicing. That's why I kept playing uh, and doing it that often. And then there'd be other days where I'd arrange practice matches. There wasn't that many practice matches with uh, billiard players, um, but uh, I did practice with my uni friends, uh, Nick Sapton and uh, Jeff Shepherd, and they used to pull the balls out for me. Uh, I remember one day, uh, Nick Sapton was a, a part-time taxi driver at uh, his uni days, and he had an hour to spare, and he rang up, do you want me to come over and have a game? And I said, okay, and uh, he broke, and I made 900, and then he went. So, uh, yeah, that was good. But in the UK, um, yeah, first goal was to win the World Professional Championship, so I practiced a lot of billiards. But uh, turned pro at snooker, and I couldn't neglect that because uh, I did have my moments. But uh, all that practice, um, it, I used to grip the cue too hard, actually, and I had an indentation on where I gripped it um, on the butt, and uh, there was a sort of groove in there, a little groove where I held it, and. Uh, caused uh, a couple of wrist injuries which uh, had an effect on my game, that's for sure. Um, so looking back, uh, I used to play a bit too tired um, on many occasions. At the height of the, my career, I suppose, there was about 10 professional snooker tournaments, very big money, and then there was nearly 10 professional billiards tournaments with the tournaments uh, sponsored in the Indian subcontinent as well. So that was 20, 20 tournaments, and then we had a pro-am scene that was uh, hard to imagine now. There were clubs everywhere in the UK, and we had the professional um, uh, the pro-am snooker tournaments, one, one every week, probably uh, in the mid-80s, one in the north of England and one in the south of England, and people could make a living just playing in those. I remember Steve uh, James, practice partner of mine and uh, Martin Clark before they turned professional, uh, they were earning very big sums, I'm talking maybe 10, 20, 30,000 pounds just with pro-ams um, and that was before they turned pro so you could make a living there so you could have a lot of tournaments there and then you had the pro-am billiard circuit which was such fun to go into. Um, Professionals and amateurs would play together and uh, there'd be a day on a Sunday and we'd uh, all play and the, the amateurs were happy to see us there uh, before there was a bit of a rift and because there was a consolation plate. So we used to have 40, 50 runners in that and uh, three, five hundred pounds to the winner. Um, and uh, they were heady days and I couldn't go in all of them but I'm trying to remember and I'm, I do repeat that but somebody might pull me up on it but from 1983 to the start of 88 only uh, Norman Dagley beat me in those tournaments because um, I didn't go in every one 
and uh, I was pretty proud of that record, that's for sure, with a lot of great players in England and you saw the countryside, it was so exciting. So in between all those things, I uh, went back to Australia every year and there was a couple of professional snooker tournaments there uh, and uh, here I should say now, uh, Winfield Masters and the Australian Championship. Uh, so there was so much uh, going on and I probably practiced too much and traveled too much. And that's why I had some highs and some very lows in my game. But uh, overall, no regrets in that regard. But it did create uh, wrist injuries as well and uh, had to play with them. The bottom line was that uh, if I stopped, which I should have for a while, lost my rankings in billiards and snooker, probably gone back to Australia and never come back. So I had to plough through it. But uh, overall, uh, exciting times again. Um, in the billiards, solo practice wasn't a chore for me because I enjoyed billiards a lot. Um, and before the World Championship in 86, I uh, year line, lining up for it, uh, used to make continual 500, 600, 700, uh, and the best break was uh, over 1100 uh, in a practice match in Northampton. So, uh, still remember that, and I got a signed uh, copy there of the people I was playing, because um, there was two people I was playing. <laughs> uh, basically, they were just boxing the balls out, but uh, yeah, in uh, the Derngate Snooker Centre, which was my home for quite a while before moving to the, to the Midlands and uh, Sandwell Snooker Centre in uh, Birmingham. Uh, the Sandwell Snooker Table, upstairs, lots of characters there, Graham Miles had a game with Rex Williams there and uh, a lot of very good snooker players as well. And uh, yeah, very tight pockets. I think uh, couldn't have a better winner than Robbie Farabari there. What a good finish he's played. What a good finish he's played. What a good finish he's played.